This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Dr. Allie Brown. Good morning. This is Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. This is the show that is completely and totally all, not really, about addressing issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. Except today we're talking about something, which we often do, that affects men and women. In fact, slightly more common in men, but, you know, very common actually in both, relatively speaking. It's colorectal cancer. You hear someone talking to the Lord over there. That's my co-host, Dr. Michelle Owens. We have several conversations throughout the course of the day. Thank you very much. Absolutely. We're pretty darn close. And we are here on this lovely Friday in the MPB studios in Jackson, Mississippi. It's a beautiful day. Beautiful day. A great day to think about spring and renewal and all the things to do for our bodies, including understand where we are in our journey with colorectal cancer screening and awareness. This is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. It's the end of the month. Just for a few more days. That's right, but we're we're not going to miss gonna out on it. We're going to squeeze in that awareness for you, though. And squeeze it out. <laughs> there you go. So welcome to the show. Dr. Owens, it's so nice to see you. It's, it's been a couple see weeks. You. I know. We have a lot, it's been a lot going on, man. We had spring break and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then, you know, just trying to kind of bounce back from that. And yeah, it's good to see you, though. Yeah, great yeah. to see you. You fear farewell in these storms? What about these storms? Oh, my gosh. I just, you know, this this time of year is just kind of becoming increasingly more treacherous. It's either like freezing or, you know, when you do get the rest, when you do get a little bit of a break with some good weather, then you have the price that you have to pay for it, you know, or a few tornadoes here and there. You know, it's over in your neck of the woods. Yeah, it kind of got kind of got pretty bad too. It got um, bad down in South Louisiana. East, yeah, yeah, and it's like, kind of south for tornadoes, but indeed, you know, it east, happened. East New Orleans, poor mm-hmm. New Orleans, oh, poor man. Ninth Ward. Oh my gosh! So East New Orleans um, was hit by a tornado, and Arabi. then there were some down in in South Mississippi. I know mm-hmm. um, we have a, a really strong base um, down on the Gulf Coast, and so we know that some of the folks down there had um, some pretty severe weather. We had a few. Um, sirens and whatnot up around this part of town but there was a we were watching the storms right we were watching the coverage and they showed this blob where the a tornado was and it was on top of my house and we were looking outside my husband had come home early from work that day because of the storms we'd kept the kids home i work from home and uh you know we did that thing that people do when you go just walk outside and you because you're like gosh it's not even windy what's going on we were those dumb people and then you heard the train no, we never heard the train, and um, never. Um, we had some strong winds, but not at that time. But I'll tell you, lots of trees snapped in half by my house, and uh, according to the radar, we had a, a hurricane. A hurricane. Oh. I'm so from South Louisiana. Okay. We had a tornado close to our house. Wow. We live over in that Renaissance area. So. Yeah. Scary, but glad to it be really here today is. on a beautiful day. Indeed. After those storms, often we do have this this beautiful weather, and here it is. Yeah, and now we get to talk about colorectal cancer, cancer prevention, um, this is, man, this is kind of one of those things that's a little personal, right? Yeah, like, no doubt. Both of us have um, had family members who were touched by this. So this is kind of a personal thing for us. Um, and I will admit that um, there were things that I knew, but I uh, definitely increased my level of awareness mm-hmm. um, once I had a family member who was diagnosed. And um, so, yeah, but... Yeah, you know, I think it's while it's personal, um, it's also I think there's a lot of positivity from that because in both of our instances, we were fortunate enough to have had family members who had early enough detection that they subsequently had a cure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, so that that part is good. So hopefully, what you guys take from this today um, is just some some good information that you know will help you to kind of make sure that you at least a know your risks. Um, and B, know what recommendations are for screening as it pertains to you and also for your family members so that you can potentially um, help or you know suggest or make sure that everybody's getting screened appropriately because, um, as Dr. Brown mentioned at the, at the outset, this is one of those things that, you know, if it's caught early enough, um, this is one of the cancers that you can, you know, get a cure from. And just like most other cancers, if it's caught too late, um, then the options are really limited and the likelihood for 
uh, for cure diminishes significantly. So um, our phone lines are open. Our good friend Liz Gill is sitting over there waiting to take your calls. The number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Um, and so we, you know, we'll take any questions or comments, but we're also um, specifically talking about colon cancer awareness. If you have a story um, that you would like to share, um, if you are a person who's a survivor, if you have a unique experience that you would like to um, help the help the public by sharing with them, please feel free to do so because we are here and would love to hear from you. Absolutely. So we need to start thinking about what are some signs and symptoms of colon cancer. Now the issue is you would hopefully catch it prior to any signs and symptoms showing up, but colorectal cancer does occur sometimes in younger folks. The recommended screening starting age at this point is 45 years of age unless you have some associated risk factors, which we'll talk about yeah. as well. But the signs and symptoms that are, you know, are things like, of course, blood in the stool, okay? And sometimes blood, depending on where it's coming from in the GI tract, it isn't necessarily bright red and looking like maybe the blood you think of when you think of blood. Absolutely. It can be dark, mm-hmm. um, kind of a brownish or a black even, just depending on where the blood is originating from. So uh, getting a good look at, at, at what comes out, you know, it's important. It is. Looking at the paper. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, and I think another important part, and we'll get to this hopefully in screening, is just that, you know, somebody's got to look where the sun don't shine. Yeah. It's hard to look there for yourself. Yeah, you, it's, uh, yeah, that's kind of hard. You know a lot about that. You spend a lot of time where the sun don't shine. <laughs> That's true, but we don't use. And, and she's a gynecologist. For those of you that don't, yeah, know. indeed, she's an OBGYN. Um, but for some, but the other thing is that you know, um, so, so yes, so primary care, so primary care physicians though are good at kind of being able to do assessments, um, and so yes, even a, a OBGYN or a gynecologist. Um, could definitely do an assessment if you happen to have problems or if you noted blood in your stools. And quite honestly, um, all all of those kinds of doctors should be asking you um, at some point in time, at least once a year, about whether or not you're ex- experiencing any of those symptoms. So if you happen to be a person who's noted some blood in your stool, um, and then there are some people who have noticed, like, say, for example, they'll notice blood on the tissue, but they may not necessarily know where that blood's coming from. Um, that's fine. Just even saying that is is helpful um, because then that can help your particular clinician determine um, what, if any, additional um, examinations or or studies might be right for you. Something else to look for would be a change in bowel habits. So if you are a fairly uh, regular person, as we say, and then you have a change. As opposed to being irregular? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if you know, you know. But if you have start having diarrhea, let's say, and it lasts more than a couple of weeks or, you know, alternating with constipation and things like that, if it's not normal for you and it's lasting more than you would like for it to last, that's another reason to go have something checked out because anything that alters the physical structure of your colon can alter the way that your stools form or don't form. Indeed. Indeed. So blood, um, change in habits, whether it's um, constipation or diarrhea, although constipation can happen for a lot of different reasons. So can diarrhea. Indeed. Um, But those are still things that you need to kind of pay attention to. A lot, of, a lot of excessive bloating or a feeling of abdominal fullness is another one that's very nonspecific. I know Dr. Owens, when I say those things, she thinks of ovarian, ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's th- those things aren't normal for any protracted amount of time. You know, everyone every now and then feels sort of bloated and things like that. But if you're noticing that it's lasting a long time and really you don't know really why it's happening, that those are all good reasons to get checked out. Absolutely. Ma'am, the number no, is one eight seven seven. No, I'm like, oh, my mouth. One eight seven seven MPB ring. That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Do you have a story to tell? Some encouraging words to encourage maybe some folks out there to get screened for colorectal cancer that perhaps are on the fence. Give us a call with your questions or comments. Oh, very quietly, I hear the music approaching. Yes. So based on that sound, what a good it fade. it's time for us to take our ne- take our first break. Crescendo. Hour. <laughs> we will be right back with Southern Remedy for Women. We are talking about colorectal cancer. Don't touch that dial because we've got some great information for you coming up right after this short break.
This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy for Women on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Allie Brown, and I'm here today with my fantastic host, Dr. Michelle Owens. We're talking about colorectal cancer. This is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and we want to make you aware of all of the things that you should know about taking care of your colon. I mean, you got to take care of everything, right? We have wonderful screening options for people for colorectal cancer. And this cancer is com- pretty much completely preventable almost 100% of the time. It's sad to see when people do have these advanced cancers because we know that um, they could be picked up on screening. Um, there are various reasons why that doesn't happen. So we want to try to eliminate those barriers for our listening audience and talk all about it today. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting that you mentioned that. Um, did you get so... You know, I love my little statistics. Um, It's estimated that about 1 in 22 men and 1 in 24 women will develop colon cancer at some point in their lifetime. And we have, you know, are always kind of talking about um, early detection, but that prevention through good screening is really key. Um, And that's because um, there are, just like with other cancers, colon cancer is divided into different stages. And I just kind of wanted to really quickly, so it's stages one through four. And when we talk about overall survivability, and we talked already about symptoms, and the problem with colon cancer is by the time you're symptomatic, um, it's much more likely that you are going to have a farther along staged um, cancer if colon cancer is the cause of your symptoms. So most of the people aren't really symptomatic until the cancer has progressed to a, a, a more, it's, well, it's more progressed. Um, but when we talk about the different stages and your overall chance um, or survival rates, I just wanted to share these because I think that that's, it, it helps to better illustrate the reasons why early detection is key. So if you are diagnosed with stage one cancer, the survival rate is 80 to 95 percent. Pretty good odds. I played that at the casino. Oh my my gosh. If that was, you know, the Powerball. Um, Stage two cancers, 55 to 80 percent survival rate. So you notice that as we go up in stage, our survival rates go down. But even at stage two, 55 to 80 percent, still pretty good, right? Um, When you get to stage three, about a 40 percent survival. And when you get to stage four, a 10 percent survival rate. So it shows you how precipitously, Mm -hmm. as we get further along in in stage as the cancer is more progressed or gets to a higher stage, how the survival rates drop off significantly. And so I thought just putting some numbers to that to kind of help people understand shows you how how important it is to be screened because in screening you can detect those cancers or precancers that may be present that could be treated by removal. Um, and then you don't have to worry about it and you don't have to worry about progression and then issues with um, a much lower opportunity for survival. And import, important point you just made, precancers, as precancerous polyps, catching it at that stage is really the best possible scenario before it even becomes cancer. We're going to go to the phone lines and talk to Dan, who's calling us from Brandon. Hey, Dan. Hi, how's it going? Great. How are you? Good. Uh, my question isn't um, colorectal related, but it is related to cancer screenings. Um, my wife has a history in her family of bladder cancers. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the uh, screening process like for that? So there isn't really a good screening test for bladder cancer. There are some cytology, let's looking at exfoliated cells from um, the bladder, either through a a urination or through some sort of a washing and things like that that can be done. But those are often done in people who are symptomatic. So looking for blood in the urine, um, obstructive type things like where they can't urinate and things like that. Um, there are cancer syndromes that may incorporate uh, bladder cancer in them, but they're not, they're not really, that's not one of the more common manifestations of hereditary or inherited cancers. 
So really looking for um, any sort of uh, blood in the urine. And if a person has just a history of chronic irritation in the bladder, um, whether that's chronic urinary tract infections or if someone, some people have to have a chronic indwelling catheter or things like that, uh, travel to certain parts of the world where certain parasites are endemic that can cause bladder irritation and cancer like Egypt, but you know, that can be a case for some. But in general, there is not um, a good screening test that's part of uh, a general exam for bladder cancer, except for perhaps when patients have um, urinalysis done at yeah, their psychology. annual exams. Yeah, and th- that's interesting that you say that because bladder cancer is not really a common cancer. Um, and we talked a lot about different things that are risk factors um, for people who have a strong family history or something like that, you know, one of the biggest contributors to bladder cancer is smoking. And so um, just encouraging those people, if they already know that they have an increased risk or if there's a high incidence of bladder cancer among other family members or relatives, then I would definitely also encourage um, that person to make sure that they're staying away from cigarettes as well, because that also is something that's known to be a major risk factor for bladder cancer development. But cytology is pretty much the the most common thing, if any, that is used at, for screening. And it's, oh, awesome! Thank you. Um, no, great. I know I know a lot of people who have been saved by identifying their cancers early, so it's an important subject. And uh, thanks for going over it. No, yeah, thank you. and just make sure when your wife sees her doctor uh, for her annual exam that she gives a good history of um, her family history of bladder cancer, and then she can be counseled by her doctor further. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Staying on the phone lines, we'll talk to Joel, who's calling us from Mobile. Hey, Joel. Yes, hello. Um, I, you know, you're talking about cancer, and uh, this is something that I've been thinking about. I don't have cancer, but my brother died of cancer because of using the weed killer uh, uh, with glyphosate. You, you know what? You, are you familiar with that? Did he have a leukemia, a blood cancer? No, he no, he had cancer because he uh, he used the weed killer, and I guess he he uh, must have walked in the in the mm-hmm. in the weed he sprayed. Anyway, so he got that that, and then he went on chemotherapy, and he died on September fourth, two thousand four, and uh, I mean two thousand. Uh, what am I saying? Two thousand twenty. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so so I just I just wonder if people are aware of that uh, of the weed killer glyphosate because every time we eat uh, uh, vegetables that have been sprayed with glyphosate, uh, aren't people worried about it? They should be. I, I think, am. Yeah, I think people definitely are. A lot of people choose to eat organic um, for a reason. Yeah. That's one of the reasons they, they choose that, because those types of chemicals are not supposed to be used in certified organic produce. And then there are lots of um, different washes and things that can be done. Um, it's always recommended to thoroughly wash your vegetables, even those sneaky ones that say they're pre-washed and ready to eat. I don't believe you. I don't believe them at all. I wash them anyway. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. And then using care, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, this is uh, in this area, uh, work in the yard a lot and are, have direct exposure to lots of different chemicals. We have a lot of farmers, you know, that are in our listening area, but just people who are uh, home farmers, you know, and mm-hmm. so direct exposure to those chemicals is dangerous as well. So wearing appropriate ventilator, respirator type um, equipment, eye protection and skin protection is extremely important so yeah I know there have been uh, yeah go ahead with this, uh, always make sure that uh, when you buy food that it's non-GMO and the reason for that in my understanding and see if, uh, tell me if, if uh, you think I'm correct uh, is because when they uh, genetically modify uh, food it's to prevent it from dying when they spray it with the uh, with the weed killer, you know, it'll kill the weeds, but not not the the modified uh, uh, food that you're going to that they're going to serve people. And so, I always make sure that I buy stuff, you know, food that is non-GMO. Uh, do you agree with that? 
you know, I personally um, don't look at that as much, um, but that is definitely something that folks focus on a lot. You know, all food that, you know, anytime there's produce, if you breed a tomato to be bigger and redder, it's technically genetically modified, you know, just by crossbreeding seeds and things like that. So, you know, there, we've been genetically modifying food since uh, we started growing food um, in, in any sort of agricultural agricultural methods. But there are definitely advantages, and people definitely bring up many advantages to uh, buying non-GMO products. And that's certainly... Um, a great option if that's um, something that is important to you. And I think that if there are people who use, um, I would say any kind of, if you have any kind of exposures to variety of clim- chemicals, whether they are pesticides or if it's weed killer or any kind of um, industrial cleaners or what have you, like any any kinds of chemical exposures that you have, um, if you protect yourself in order to minimize the exposure of your skin and your your airway to um, chemicals, I think that that you're doing your body a favor. You know, when I think about it, Dr. Owens, um, you think about OSHA regulations and things like that. There's a lot of regulation as to chemical exposures at work. And being a pathologist and working in a laboratory, formaldehyde or formalin exposure is Mm -hmm. a big one that um, pathologists and laboratory professionals are exposed to. And there really has to be adequate ventilation, and that ventilation needs to be tested, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we don't really have that at our houses, right? right? And we have all sorts of cleaning products and garden products. You know, you walk in the garage, it smells kind of funny because of all the killer weed killers or fungicides and that. So it's really, there's no one, you know, necessarily looking out for us. You really have to look out for yourself and use common sense and look at those labels. You know, no one's going to put their face in the bottle of bleach because they smell it and it's going to be very noxious. But some well, may be slightly even less noxious, but still harmful. So well, thank, thank you, for, you very much. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you, thank Joel. You. Thanks for bringing up that very important. Mm-hmm. And I'm sorry about your brother. Okay. All right. Thank you. You bet. All right, Owens. So um, we well we spoke about symptoms to begin with, but um, let's go on to to some of the risk factors because we did get a chance to talk. We you've learned about even a risk factor for bladder cancer today, but we're going to talk also about some uh, risk factors for uh, colorectal cancer. And so there are some that we call modifiable or things that you have some control over, and then there are some that you may not have control over. We talked about one, which is that polyp. That um, that Dr. Brown talked about. Um, so the presence of polyps, um, if you have polyps or um, polyp syndromes or things like that, then that can increase your risk um, for colorectal cancer. What should we get? What, what should we do? Modifiable or non non modifiable first? Let's talk about modifiable. <laughs> I like the ones that you can. The help. ones that you actually have. There's something you can do about. Do something about. Um, okay, so um, I'll go first. Um, how about obesity? Modify it. That's a risk. It is a risk, though. So if you are um, a person who is um, overweight to the point that your BMI is 30 um, kilograms per meter squared um, or higher, then you are uh, definitely at risk. So obesity is a a risk. Um, Sedentary lifestyle. Um, I kind of think about things that I can kind of group together. Um, So sedentary lifestyle also increases your risk for colorectal cancer. High fat, low fiber diet, Ooh. right? That kind of you can put that together too, because having a high fat diet could lead to obesity. Well, one of the questions that I had is because think about it: these fad diets that people mm-hmm. are on, where you know you can consume these large amounts of fat. Right. I wonder if that's going to ultimately make a make a change or somehow increase, um, you know, colon cancer rates or whatever mm-hmm. down the road if we continue to kind of do those things because I, I mean i feel like when we start these diets you don't have the the long-term data on those kinds of things the implications Any of extreme that diet, you, know? you know can have unintended well anything can have unintended consequences right but i worry i do worry about these extreme diets um the ones with extremely high fat content for colon cancer risk um for gallbladder disease you know because uh, you can definitely get gallstones mm-hmm. from having a very fatty diet um, for certain people, you know, people have different lipid profiles and different susceptibilities to elevated lipids. For some people with those diets, they're actually their their cholesterol goes down. But for some people, it does increase. And yeah. so there are a lot of um, consequences to any sort. That's why really moderation is what's encouraged. And a diet that's higher in fiber and lower in fats um, is really what's healthy for your colon. Well, and then also the, the way that you prepare your food. 
is can mm-hmm. can also um, potentially increase your risk too. So, cooking um, food well, not foods per se, but specifically meats at really high temperatures. Mm-hmm. So, with if you're frying, um, broiling, or grilling, can also char broil. Yeah, it's good. Though. I know it is so good. Yeah, but maybe oh. don't go to the barbecue every week. <laughs> not every week, not every week, but sometimes. Um, there's a correlation of um, low vitamin D levels too, and uh, colorectal cancer, go which outside. was one that I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, go I know. Outside, go get outside, you get you some sun, get you some sun. Um, also, when people have high uh, intake of not just red meats, but red meats or processed. Processed foods. foods, Processed foods, another one. And dun dun dun, alcohol. Yep. Alcohol alcohol and cigarette use are also things that are modifiable, right? Things that we have the ability to control. And through controlling our consumption um, or through abstinence, um, we can make a significant impact on our overall risk. So those are things. there are definitely so we were talking about those modifiable risk factors, um, but then there are also some things that you don't unfortunately have the ability to change. Oh, I see that first one on your list. I'm, I I <laughs> suffer from that. Getting older. <laughs> That's better than the alternative, right? That's Indeed, one of my dad's jokes the, he used it, to say. It, it beats, beats the, alternative. the alternative. He also used to say about having had a colon resection that he now had a semicolon. <laughs> Just thought I'd give a little colon humor there. That but was, yes, that was funny age. for all of the for all of my English nerds out there. Mm-hmm. That was that one was just for us. Um, so yeah, um, b- being being older definitely um, a personal history of polyps or cancer. That's right. So if you've had a colonoscopy in the past and you yourself, it's a personal history, had polyps on that screening, you are right then and there. You bought yourself an elevated risk for developing colon cancer and you're really encouraged to stay on your screening schedule um, looking for future polyps or masses. Absolutely. Um, people who have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and so those folks who are the ulcerative colitis people, um, if you have um, Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease is the other, then all of those. And that's not the same, guys, as irritable bowel. We're talking about inflammatory bowel um, disease. Um, and if you have irritable bowel, that is not um, considered a risk factor, it does not increase your risk for colorectal cancer. So that's just something to remember because... They sound kind of similar, and and with folks who have um, irritable bowel, you can vacillate between. It's the yeah. issue with bowel habits, right? And so having going back and forth between constipation or diarrhea, or having chronic constipation, or what have you. So just know that if you have IBS, that is separate and distinct. Irritable bowel syndrome, yeah, from irritable and bowel syndrome. Folks with irritable bowel syndrome who have this alternating diarrhea and constipation, just unstable, um, often unpleasant bowel habits, um, those that can mask the symptoms of potential colon cancer. Yeah. So it's really important to get checked out and to make sure that you get screened as well. Absolutely. Even though the risk is not necessarily higher because of the disease itself. And um, family history, of course, um, is something that increases your risk. As a matter of fact, if you have a family history, sometimes that means that you are lucky enough to get chosen for earlier screening. So that's a great point, Dr. Owen. So the screening age recommendation is currently 45 years of age. So once you turn 45, it's time for you to start getting uh, screened for colorectal cancer. That being said, if you have a first degree relative, which is often a parent, maybe a sibling, who had colon cancer before the age of 45, the recommendation is that you're screened at least 10 years prior to the age of when that person developed colon cancer. So if they were, you know, 46, then you start getting screened at 36. You know, it's really important to mention this to your physician because you may have other risk factors that uh, may warrant screening even maybe earlier. So just know that if you have a history of a of a first year relative who had colon cancer at or before the age of 55, make sure that you mention that history to your doctor so they can get you on appropriate screening protocol. Yeah, and I think that's another good point that as as you were saying that, it made me think that, that sometimes when we are um, evaluating patients in the office, we may say, you know, do any illnesses run in your family or for family history, right? Like we might, that might be the question that is posed. Um, are there... 
or what illnesses run in your family? Well, some people might feel like just because one person has it, um, or they may say, "How how's the health of your mother or your father? So specifically asking about individuals. It, if a person has a history, I would submit to you that any history of cancer of any kind should be included in that list. Okay, so if somebody asks you something similar, inquiring about your family history, um, even if that person is um, ha- has been cured, say for example, they are either in remission or have had a cure of of their cancer, then please, please, please make sure that you consider that and include that information in your family history information to your clinician. Really important. It counts. It the, totally counts. The it number totally is one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. We are talking about colorectal cancer. We've been talking about risk factors. Um, we're starting to talk now about screening. We have lots of different options for screening that have come about in more recent years. And so we're going to talk about what are the pros and cons of each one? When are they recommended? And we're going to talk about that thing that everybody wants to talk about, but nobody really wants to talk about. I'll talk about it. The colonoscopy. It's yeah, a good nap. Yeah. Go on and schedule it. And that prep, getting ready. That you'll feel thinner than ever. So we're prepping you now for the next segment. Oh, my goodness. This is Southern Remedy for Women. It will be less painful. On MPB Think Radio. <laughs> This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Thanks for joining us. You are listening to Southern Remedy for Women, where we address issues of health and wellness from a woman's perspective. And today's issue... It's Colon Cancer Awareness. I am here in the studio with my lovely co-host and bestie, Dr. Allie Brown. She's a pathologist. I'm an OBGYN, a maternal fetal medicine specialist. And together, we are the dynamic duo of Southern Remedy for Women. <laughs> I feel like we need a cape or something. We need like capes I'm or masks. I'm wearing a cape right now. Capes or masks. You guys don't even know. <laughs> I'm tired of masks, but the cape will do. Oh, goodness. Oh, I meant like a costume mask, not like a yeah, mask I know what mask. You meant. I know what you meant. <laughs> so yeah, so we um, so we were talking about um, colon cancer awareness, um, and man, did our phone lines light up. We have got Woo! some callers on the line, and so before we get to chatting it up, we're going to hear directly from you guys. We're going to go to the phone lines first and hear from Mark, who's calling us from Tupelo. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Docs. How are y'all doing? We are doing great this fine day. How about yourself? I'm uh, good. I just got off work 40 minutes ago for the weekend, so I'm happy. Oh, congrats. Well, happy weekend. What's your question, right, Mr. Mark? Thing. Uh-huh. Uh, here's the thing. Uh, I know for a fact I lost a uh, uncle. He, he was at 48 years old when he died of colon cancer, but uh, around his 42nd birthday, he was uh, already stage 2 of colon cancer. And he made it through chemo, but still passed away at age 48. Uh, One of my high school classmates' mothers uh, passed away from uh, colon cancer also. She was in her upper 60s. Anyway, long story short, uh, I ended up having a uh, hemorrhoid about the same time he passed away. And it scared the dickens out of me, and I ended up getting checked. Uh, over at the VA hospital in Memphis, and I come to find out I was the youngest vet to ever get a colonoscopy done. Uh, they found four polyps, all were uh, uh, non-positive for uh, for uh, colon cancer. That's great. You got those. But is there early? anything? Mm-hmm. Is there any? Uh, I, I'm due up for another one, but there, is there any way? To bypass the dead gum prep 
<laughs> well, I've got good news and I've got bad news for you, Mark. Um, there are other options for screening for polyps. However, the fact that you've had polyps in the past uh, probably would not be recommended. You can talk to your gastroenterologist about that. But usually for people at an increased risk for colon cancer, including those who have a history of colon polyps, um, they do advocate that you go ahead and get the, the screening colonoscopy. The good yeah. news is that preps have come a long way. Oh, and I my gosh. Would, I would request... Uh, one of the more low volume preps. So I don't know what prep you used in the past. I've had several colonoscopies uh, over the I years. The, uh, I've used the worst I, and the I, best. I was using the I go was lightly. The, uh, taint, I was using the tainted gallon of water. <laughs> yes, so, go lightly. So and, ask and to not say, have I that. Tell you this much. Yes. After doing that, I was scared as hell to drink water. For two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so there are better options now, Mark. There are better options. So when you're scheduling your colonoscopy, just go ahead and ask them for an alternative prep. Ask them for one that's a lower volume. Um, there's, there are some where you take a, a certain kind of medication, then you drink just water. You know, you don't have to drink all that um, Go Lightly or whatever brand was being used. It's that big osmotic, you know, diarrhea where you kind of put this high hypertonic solution in your bowel and it draws all the water in. But there are ways to do that in a, in a more gentle, gentle and, and palatable way. So, Mark, go ahead and schedule that colonoscopy and do inquire about right. alternatives for preps. There's also a prep right. called... Um, one uh, more, one oh. more partial question for you. Uh, just a partial uh, one now, okay. <laughs> yeah, my mother pa- I- my mother has a uh, Crohn's disease. Should I be concerned also uh, about the colon cancer also? So Crohn's disease does tend to run in families. It's associated with a certain um um, antigen type that people have um, on their on their blood cells, and so um, there is an increased risk of you developing Crohn's disease. Doesn't mean that you will. And then if you have Crohn's disease, that is an increased risk. But if you don't have the disease, but your first year relative has it, then that does not increase your risk per se. But your history of polyps does put you at a higher risk. So and go ahead and she's go, she's also going to tell you about this new fancy this newfangled um, prep. That's right. She's outside had of the, the low volume one, but um, you were going to mention that other one. Oh, there's a, a, another prep. It goes by different names. I know one of the names is Hygia Care. It, it essentially goes um, uh, from the reverse side, so it's almost like a, a colonic. It's um, almost it's not like a colonic, an, it's but kind of like a kind of like an enema irrigation kind of thing. Right. If so you could f- imagine, you sit in this contraption and they flush it out from the bottom. So if you're really a to drinking that stuff, um, you can find um, an, a, something in your area, someone who offers that service as well. Okay. I'll definitely check on that. Like I said, I'm due up for another uh, colonoscopy. All right. Yeah, Mark, it. make sure you do I don't it. Wanna, I don't want to do that tinted water. <laughs> okay, Mark. Well, you go on and get it done, Mark. There's, uh, we're lowering the barriers and the reasons that people would say no to do such a thing. Staying on the phone lines, what do you know? We've got another Mark who's calling us from Starkville. Hey, Mark. How are y'all today? I'm doing great. I just wanted to, well, <laughs> add to that. I'm 36 years old, and my brother got diagnosed, older brother got diagnosed and was stage four when he was 32 and, and passed away shortly after, oh, about six months later. What a tragedy. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And he, his was an interesting case. The, he had some a symptom, you know, with a lot of blood in the stool. He went and went to a general practitioner, and based off his age... They told him he probably it was something else and uh, not to worry about it and that the colonoscopy wasn't necessary. So nothing happened. And then like a year later, it happened again. And then he went in and got a colonoscopy and stage four at that age, but uh, at that stage. But a uh, couple questions I had. One, just going back to what the previous Mark said, uh, yeah, the go lightly is terrible. I've done two of them. So I get, I get screened every five years. Mm-hmm. And, yes, it's brutal. But if anyone's listening and you have to do it your first time, do not choose the gallon jug. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. The gallon jug of Go Lightly is miserable. They have, like you said, they have much more options now. Uh, sometimes insurance covers them differently, I found, but mm-hmm. it's actually just worth it uh, to do the, the smaller dose. But I did have a question because I've gone, I've had two now, and, and, and luckily everything's been fine. My older, other older brother gets one. Every, we, we go every five years now. But has there been, y'all may have said this earlier in the show, I, I just tuned in late. <clears throat> Have we seen an increase in the U.S. of colon cancer uh, cases in younger populations? Because not just my brother. I had a guy I went to high school with yeah. who, who died about a six months before my brother was diagnosed. And he was my age of colon cancer. So is, what are the national trends looking like on this particular disease? 
I know when you look at the state of Mississippi, the incidence is increasing. Um, I don't know about specifically in which age range. I would imagine it's probably for all age ranges. Oh, Dr. Owens, do you have some information on no, that? No, no, you can oh. go ahead and finish your thought, and okay. then I would, and then I'll go ahead and throw that. Out uh, there. But, but yeah, I think uh, it's not uncommon now, kind of, to know someone who is diagnosed at a lower stage. I do want to touch on just with your brother with the bleeding. I would just say to everyone out there, if you have unexplained lower GI bleeding or really unexplained bleeding from anywhere in your body really don't you know it needs to be investigated thoroughly so you don't just sort of say oh you get one giant bleed for free you know I would demand you know you can always go see a second opinion and I know it's too late for your brother and I'm sorry for that but if we can bring this awareness to anyone in the listening area if you've had a similar situation regardless of how old you are because really we see cancers of all types in all different ages unfortunately just go ahead and, you know, you don't, you don't have to stay with one doctor. You can seek a second opinion and really get, get things investigated. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up that story, and hopefully we can bring something positive from this tragedy that your family has had to suffer. And I will tell you this, Mark, just following up on, on what Dr. Brown said. So there, so even though age is um, – increasing age is a risk factor – there is still kind of a baseline population rate. And so in the 30 to 34 year age group, the rate is about 5.7 per 100,000. So it still happens. It just doesn't happen. When you look at those who are 70, it's 153 per 100,000. So you see it's a significant difference between that 30 year mark and the 70 year mark. Um, when we look at those from 35 to 39, that number doubles. Okay, so 30 to 34, yeah. 5.7, mm-hmm. 35 to 39, 10.5 per 100,000. And then in the 40 to 44 population, it doubles again almost 19 per 100,000. And then from 45 to 49, 33.1 per 100,000. Now, the other part is in the American Cancer Society's last report on colorectal cancer that was released in um, 2020, they mentioned the incidence is increasing in younger adults. So what you have okay. mentioned is exactly spot on. It is becoming more prevalent in younger people. And I don't know if that is because of the the more chronic state of obesity, diet, and, and processed foods and all of those things that are kind of a part of our lives that we've kind of normalized now. But it is definitely noted that colorectal cancer patients overall are increasingly younger. When we looked at the early, the turn of the century, right around the early 2000s, that the median age was 72 and now it's 66. So we're seeing, wow. yeah, the, so the, the middle is shifting down which lets us know that more and more younger people are being impacted. And you might remember the screening age used to be recommended at 50, so they have dropped the age um, for recommended screening for colonoscopy to 45, as we said before, So um, with just within the past 10 years or so. So I think that um, the United States Preventive Task Force is responding to that increased risk. But there is always going to be some sort of cutoff, right? And that's why family history and risk factors are so important um, in order to perhaps even drop that further. Thank you so much for your call, though. No, that was great. I have one real quick thing, since y'all, Dr. Brown brought the point about even if you have that symptom, please go get screened. His case was really crazy because he had it the one time. They told him it was probably just a one-time thing, and it honestly didn't happen again mm-hmm. for almost a year, yeah. which which was really confusing. Just to give more, just to add that to the fact that just go get checked. Yeah. <laughs> And um, insist on a colonoscopy, uh, which is, you know, what we should have done, of course. But anyway, thank you all for listening and for the information. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for your call and for sharing your story. All right. We have we are going to stay on the phone lines and hear from Mikey, who's calling us from Mobile. Hey, Mikey, good morning. Hey, the third Mike. Hey. (laughs) (laughs) And I've got to say, you know, I don't have capes for you all, but I do have a fanfare. Okay, it's going to be quick. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks. I don't know if we should charge or what, but so what's your question hey, this hey. morning? Yeah, charge whatever you can get, okay? <laughs> um, uh, my, my question is something that you're probably going to hate. That's one reason I needed to throw in a fanfare, um, because I don't know that anybody can answer this. Uh, and this relates back to uh, things you were discussing as far as diet earlier. Um, everything from... You know, growing your own, which is next door, like uh, maybe on a small plot like I have, um, to your neighbors who do use a lot of chemicals and things, to picking up things in the grocery store. Um, my question is, 
uh, when you wash things, the water soluble vitamins wash out, don't they? So what what are we what what you gonna do? You know, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I I do spray a little. I have a spray bottle of a vinegar solution that I spray sometimes on things that I get from the grocery store. Now the stuff that I grow, of course, I just stand out in the garden and eat it. Oh, yeah, save time and, and, and energy, not even walking. Mikey, uh, water is not going to wash away water-soluble vitamins. are still going to be contained within the cells. So it doesn't washing your vegetables isn't going to actually wash them out of the, the cells of the vegetable themselves. Cooking sometimes can denature vitamins or, you know, um, uh, decrease the uh, absorption, et cetera, you know, uh, like boiling things. And so fresh vegetables are usually thought to be best. It doesn't mean that cooked vegetables aren't good and aren't as good. Many of them are, you know, steam things. And, and, and some some cooking methods are better than others. That's right? right. That's right. So it's still advantageous. And that fiber, you know, we talked about a high fiber diet, regardless of, 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 of the vitamins, is, is what's really healthy for your colon as well. So even those cooked yeah. vegetables. <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead and wash those vegetables. You're not going to wash out those vitamins, Mikey. You'd be have to, having to do some kind of wash to get those vitamins washed out. So, yeah, I think you're in good I, shape. I ain't going to wash them if I'm standing in the garden and they look really great. I'm sorry, okay? Yeah, just hold them up to <laughs> the rain. rain. There you go. And it's just rain. As long as you don't have a dog, you know, you're all good. Just go with it. i got two dogs. Oh, dog boy, Mikey. You might want to wash They're them. They're right behind me. Take care. Uh, <laughs> oh, thanks, Mikey. Thanks for your call, and thanks for the fanfares. Two fanfares. It was a two, two fanfare day. Two fanfares. Usually I have zero. Today I, I had two. See there? Just a brief mention. I know we're getting toward the end of the show, but there are some other options for patients who have just an average risk for the development of colon cancer. So none of the associated risk factors we talked about before. Of course, you should always talk about these options with your doctor. And that is doing uh, various types of um, testing for blood in the stool that can be done at home. Kind of the old-timey one is the one that we do called a fecal occult blood test where we react uh-huh. it with this chemical Um, to see if there's blood in the stool. There's another one that looks at um, human hemoglobin. Um, So if you've eaten a steak, you know, you can have iron in your stool or heme, which is what it's looking for with that occult blood test. But there is a test also that looks at human hemoglobin, which is more specific. But those tests are not as sensitive. You can have false positives and false negatives. And if you do have a positive test from one of those tests, the next step is to have a colonoscopy because there's no diagnostic uh, side to that. There's no way to actually have a look inside and, and, and take a biopsy, et cetera. So it doesn't get you off the hook. And those are that should be done every year. There's another option that looks at certain tumor markers in stool. Um, and that test is done either yearly or every three years. Again, if the test is positive, um, you then uh, have to progress to have a colon cancer, I mean, sorry, a colonoscopy to actually get a tissue diagnosis, which is the gold, sta- gold standard. Um, and, and those um, DNA tests do have a not insignificant false positive rate. So just because it's positive doesn't mean that you actually are positive uh, for cancer. So it has to be confirmed with colonoscopy. Um, there's also some um, high resolution imaging, so a CT scan that looks very carefully. Um, at the colon, and, and um, that's another option. I think that's every five years or so, but go ahead and talk to your physicians about that. And that's for, just for folks who maybe, um, you know, are for some reason averse to or have a contraindication to having a colonoscopy. The imaging tests do require a bowel prep before, just like a colonoscopy would. The other two tests, the um, fecal blood test and the um, DNA test do not. In fact, you, you, you um, collect stool uh, for that sample, so... Um, it, it you don't have to do any sort of bowel prep, but you know you have to weigh the pros and cons for each. Um, and as a pathologist, you know the tissue is always uh, the gold standard to yeah, actually absolutely. make that diagnosis. What would you say to the person who might have a history or whatever? I think you know we've heard some people who have shared pretty tragic losses that their families have experienced, um, and have also subsequently seen the changes that that's brought about in their own preventive health care. Um, what would you say to the person who just might have seen a family member struggle and who might be afraid to find out? Yeah, well, what we say about all these cancers, right? You're, it's not going to make it not be there just because you don't look. And you're really empowering yourself to get it um, diagnosed as early as you possibly can because we saw those survival rates that Dr. Owens talked about earlier. So really, it's it's not about being scared. It's about empowering yourself. So all I can do is encourage positivity and encourage you to take a hold of 
um, your health care, schedule it. Just set a date. Say, I'm going to schedule it. I'm going to have it done in such and such a month. You know, you set yourself a goal for it. Maybe call a friend who's also due. Do it together. You know, just whatever you can take to get yourself over that initial hump to get it done. Get it done, right, Jay White? Yeah, we got a fanfare uh, again. That would be three. Jay was throwing fists the in there. He was getting so excited. The That's trifecta. Right. Today's a triple fanfare day. Had me motivated. That's right. Go I get your colonoscopy. If you're 45 years of or older, go on. Today's Southern Remedy was uh, engineered by Jay White. Our call screener was Liz Gill. For Dr. Michelle Owens, I am Dr. Allie Brown. Um, join us next week for another Southern Remedy for Women. NPR's here and now is next on MPB Think Radio. Y'all be safe, be kind.